What's happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 26, the official Voyager 3 podcast. We're back. We're talking about all kinds of fun things. Greg, Aaron, how you guys doing? I'm doing, I'm I'm good, doing quite fine. I'm quite good. fine. I'm good. I'm good. All right. It's quite late, fine. man. Good. It's late. We're staying up late. Well, I got to know. It's that time of the show where we talk about what are we drinking? Aaron, you look thirsty. Tell me what you got. Nothing fancy. Get that Just, guy up uh, here. A pretty common sight here is the Coors Banquet. All right. So we're going to get Man. a nice little. You didn't even go with the, the Modelo tall boy that I got you, huh? No. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was last saving, night. Man. He's saving that. Saving that yeah. for a special occasion. That's right. Yep. Aaron's got a standard brew that doesn't let him down. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes sometimes you take a chance on things. Sometimes you go with the tried and true. That's right. No shame in that game. All right, Greg. Greg. What do you got rocking over there in probably a Beatles glass? Oh, see, I knew you guys were going <laughs> to. I knew you were going to predict that. So I'm ahead of you. Um, this beer actually comes with a story. So you guys probably know because I talk about them all the time. Tangerine Dream is one of my favorite bands. That's right. I yep. just for my birthday, got tickets to see Tangerine Dream in Chicago at the Metro yes. in October. So I'm pretty excited about that. But transitioning to what are you drinking, along with my tickets came this beer. Oh, Can you read it? Jello Dream by yeah. Ludington Bay. Is, is, is yeah. Ludington Bay the brewery? Yes. Ludington Bay Brewing Company. Tangelo Dream. I thought that was pretty awesome that my uh, family was able to find a beer that tied in with the tickets that they got me. You know, that's so, kind of amazing, really. I mean, what's the odds of that? That's kind of a particular name, right? <laughs> I agree. It's crazy. Wow. So it's an American pale ale and it's made with Tangelos and it's got turmeric color. So it's 5.7%. Let's get this open. Did you hear it? Greg's got splashed the best all, cracks. Splashed all over my ear too. So now <laughs> I've got Tangelo. I got Tangelo ear. <laughs> and just so you know, this is in my Coonan's glass, not my Beatles glass. So nice. whatever. It's pretty good. I can tell you it's very heavy on the citrus. Tastes okay. very much like a Tangelo. That's fun. That's fun. Because I like eating. So, anyways, tangerine. how poor am I gonna be at that tangerine dream concert? Oh, I mean, if they have so. vinyl, if they have vinyl and T-shirts, I'm, I'm, I mean, forget it. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to take out a loan. I'm gonna be in trouble. Yeah. You're gonna be walking home from Chicago. Yeah, That's with right. all my merch. At least it won't be cold because you can like triple up on the T-shirts and keep you warm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I'm bringing to the table something I never had before. I, uh, I happened to be in CVS last week, and I, and I looked in the cooler to see if there's anything unusual or different. And I came across guru energy drink. Oh yeah. my God. Well, organic energy. I don't know what organic energy means. So I did get two of them and I had one last week and, uh, hopefully I can get a good crack on this one for you guys to hear it nice and loud. You think? Hopefully that came across. I figured no. if I, if, I, if I, I talk I with it, then I won't gate on the mic. I don't know. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know it's what good. I noticed about a lot of energy drinks besides like my staples, which would be Red Bull or Monster, they all have a varying degree of like a, medi a medicinal taste to them. Yeah. And you either well, get used the to weed, it Steve. or you don't. You know, it's kind of like, like back when you were a kid and maybe you had like congestion and you had to get a penicillin. They all kind of yeah. remind me of like that kind of stuff. Um, this, this is pretty good though. It, it's, uh, I don't know if I can even describe, it's not like fruity. It's uh, maybe like that whole sweet tart thing that a lot of these energy drinks have. It's got a, a hint of that. But uh, pretty right. good. Cheers, cool. Guru. All right, well, we are going to keep it moving, and we're going to bust into the headlining topic of this episode of V3Cast. I've been wanting to talk about this film for a while. I got introduced to it because we scored New York Ninja. So the connection is that uh, the writer and star and director of New York Ninja, John Liu, also starred in The Invincible Armor, 1977 uh, Hong Kong Taiwanese Kung Fu film. Um, 
absolutely fantastic film. And I'll tell you another thing about it too, is if the Wu Tang clan likes it, y'all better like it. I know yeah. that for sure yeah, because bro. they've sampled pieces of it um and talk about it and kind of um cherish it, you know, all that kind of stuff over the years. It's got everything that you need in a movie like that. It's actually expertly written in my opinion. It's and it's another one of those films kind of like probably John Liu learned lessons from starring in these films because he only just was an actor. He didn't have any hand in the production or the writing like New York Ninja. So he probably learned along the way on all these films he did to to do a lot with a little. Um just clever little things, disguises or just ways to tell the story and just the way you film stuff. It, this has all that. It's got a really cool story. Let me read you guys the uh the tagline from at least from IMDb. I don't know if it's ab- absolutely official, like if it was on the poster or whatever, but uh, a corrupt official frames a man for murder. The man studies a martial arts style that makes his body as strong as iron so he can counter the official's own incredible fighting skills. Ooh, man. Sign me yeah. up. Yeah, it's so, like, it's that classic, um, you know, kung fu movie that we grew up on in, in our era oh, yeah. where um all the guys have the long hair yeah and it's you always know, white even yeah, though some of them are white some of them are some of them are black hair but they all have the long hair with like the top knot and yeah the, the uh the cool clothes that almost look like futuristic but they're ancient like you know chinese style um <clears throat> um robes you know, and cloaks and stuff. casual casual clothes and uh and then you have usually have one or two guys with the white hair with the long beard you know um and and like it the guy playing the white-haired guy is always like in his 20s just like yeah he's like a totally young guy in an yeah. old man wig <laughs> yeah they just give him white hair and it's like oh, okay he's old and he moves just as fast or better than all the other people in the movie and um the women are kicking ass. The kids are kicking ass. So, yeah, you know, there's the, always a kid. There's always yeah. a young kid. Yeah, man. So I'm telling you, they have this like a certain kind of formula, but not in a negative connotation to these kind of films. And it's wonderful, man, for sure. Yeah, it's a tradition. You know, another interesting tidbit about this film is that the score is completely uh, taken from a different film, from a, uh, an Italian spaghetti western the uh, the name of it is Day of Anger, and it's by a Italian composer, um, Riz Ortonelli, and uh, he has a lot of credits. You can look him up on IMDb. He's done a a bunch of stuff. Didn't Speaking. he do Cannibal Holocaust, Steve? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Which is another well, great every, score. Everybody knows that one. Yep. So yeah. For if you sure. want to know who the guy is, that's him. Yeah. So I went I, I went ahead and bought the the actual soundtrack to Day of Anger on vinyl. So a lot of the uh, music, almost all the music from The Invincible Armor is from this film, 1967. And uh, it's great. Spaghetti Western style. You'll recognize that style the minute you hear it. It's it's very particular. But here's another cool kind of uh, other factoid is that there is a little bit of other music in the film sprinkled around. It's, a lot of it is kind of synthesizer based and kind of more ominous than the Spaghetti Western vibe. And uh, the only other name attached uh, to this to the to this film for music is uh, Fu Liang Chu. They don't say what he does or anything like that, but it, I'm assuming that it has to be that guy did that extra stuff, the synth stuff, uh, the more electronic y stuff. Um, and then he also has a credit for Death Proof, believe it or not, uh, Quentin Tarantino's, I believe, 2007 film. And then so when I read about Death Proof, it said there's no original music for Death Proof. Quentin Tarantino just used stuff from a whole bunch of other films. So maybe that's kind of the tie-in. I don't know. But isn't that interesting? Like, so so Quentin Tarantino on purpose, because obviously he can afford to and has the resources to get any composer he wants. So, uh, But he decided to do kind of like an old school move and just compile, you know, uh, Death Proof's score with a bunch of other stuff that's already been used. <laughs> I love it. It's, so it's all. totally paying homage and you know carrying that mojo um yeah. what were some of your guys's favorite parts of the film i, I guess we're trying to keep it spoiler free but i mean you know i don't think we need to since uh it's like 40 something years right old. right yeah we don't true. have to carry that responsibility of 
not spoiling an old ass movie like that. But um, I, I like uh, I like the the classic thing in those movies and other movies too. But when you have like you know a guy who's who's like on the run, and then there's somebody go, coming after him, and he's like, "I'm I'm gonna get you for what you did," and then he says something to him or maybe they fight first and then they become friends and then they team right. up like that's right. just that's so classic it's in so many of the you know like it was it's just it's like uh in wrestling when 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 rowdy rowdy piper turned turned face and, and became a good guy it was like the coolest thing because you knew him as such a mean bastard and yeah. so in any movie or or series um and a lot of times in, in Japanese stuff, in Japanese animation and stuff, I don't know if they did it as much in in straight up American shows, but like whenever they'd have like the bad guy sort of redeem himself and, and turn good, that that was always cool. So I like that part. Um, the, the I don't remember the guy's names, but the guy who was sent to take him in. Yeah, and yeah. The guy uh, in, in the red robes, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember his name either, but yeah, great fighting too from uh, fighting. from ev- all all those key people, just incredible fighting. Yeah, and it's it's pretty much nonstop. I mean, there's just fights all the way through the movie, and they're they're so well done. That's not always easy to do well. We've seen a lot of those movies where it's funny the way they're fighting, like right. and not intentionally funny. But this movie was like high quality. Uh, stunts and choreography and everybody was you could tell they were really committed to like you know doing it right and who knows how many takes they had to do to get all that stuff right but they didn't do it sloppy at all right oh yeah all of it's really tight and really yeah. hard hitting and the sound effects everything is right on the money for sure the uh training montage in the very beginning when they're explaining to you what iron armor is and and, and what all that is and they're going through like the 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 text of it all so like you know there's the handbook to learn it and the breathing uh rhythm and uh how you can make your whole body invincible then they're showing the younger guy uh you know as he was learning it you know falling onto us a, a, a sharp spear and getting um a, a big spiked ball hit in his face and his crotch and everything and is not phasing him at all it's just so good man so good yeah <laughs> yeah so i gotta come clean you know this is my first time watching it and i i had to try to watch it twice and i fell asleep both times so <laughs> Reg. that's not that's that's not a slight on the movie what i saw was really good but you know i was i was trying to watch it too late that's the problem but uh the thing we talked about at practice last night on the way out was um I immediately noticed that the music seemed out of place. You know what I mean? Like it just, and and again, I'm not being, I'm not being critical of it, but I could tell that, you know, now that you, now that you say that it was borrowed from another source, it totally makes sense because like I said, like the parts that I did see, like the guys would just be walking down the street and there's this really ominous, like, (laughs) like music for no reason, you know, the way I saw it. Yeah. And, uh, it just didn't it, kind of it's fit. like they were just kind of like putting it in there because they had it or they, you know, felt like it needed something. So I don't know. I mean, I get why people like this movie. I mean, like you said, it's got all like the, you know, John Liu does that thing where he kicks up like almost like perpend, you know, straight up to his head. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they show up, they show off like how high he can kick and all that quite a bit. So it's got, like you said, it's got all the, the standard tropes that you'd be looking for in a movie like this. So, I mean, what I saw was great. Uh, maybe one day I'll make it all the way through. <laughs> How far did you get like six minutes in it? You know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a dream to me. <laughs> <laughs> I only have, I only have bits and pieces of the movie. I remember, I remember you talked about the guy who was coming to look for him. And I remember like, I remember them setting that up and then I must've faded out. And then at some point, like the guy actually finds him and he's there with the kid and the girl, you know, who's looking at him from the doorway and yeah. as they're taking him away and, and all that. So 
I don't know, man. It's all kind of fuzzy to me. Maybe, maybe one day I'll watch the whole thing and put it together. But right yeah, now, it's just... you missed about thirty or thirty-five minutes in between those two things that you just said. I'd say roughly. <laughs> yeah, so that's how long I fell asleep. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. <laughs> it's not the movie's fault. Let me just be clear: it's not the movie's fault. Oh, I've yeah. had tons of those where it took me. Uh, I don't even. I can't even tell you an example, um, but tons of different movies where it took me like three or four sittings because of life here's a, to get through. Here's a know. great, here's a great example. Remember when we went to LA Yeah. Mm-hmm. For, for the premiere of, of New York Ninja and Aaron was sitting right next to me struggling during uh yes, madam. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah they played. Aaron, probably only, Aaron probably only remembers about 20 minutes of that movie. Yeah. Man, I think that movie too it. was so good. And you know yeah. what the worst part of that is? He was sitting almost directly behind Cynthia Rothrock in uh, Don the Dragon. He was sitting right behind him, sleeping through it. (laughs) I hope they didn't see you, Aaron. In in Aaron's defense, that flight from from Detroit to L.A., you know, with the time change. And Steve and I were struggling, too, but we had been pounding coffee all afternoon. For folks who love these kind of films, first of all, I would say watch The Invincible Armor immediately. It's on Tubi, believe it or not. We are big fans. Big fans of Tubi here at V3 Cast. So this film happens to be on Tubi. But if you like this vibe, that's the same combo of people. And when I say that, I mean the writer, uh, Lu Tung, and the director, Si Young Ning, uh, also wrote and directed, respectively, The Secret Rivals, which also stars John Liu and the, um, the minister, uh, Chang, who is uh, Hong John Lee. Uh, the guy with the white hair, basically. The, the, one of the two guys with the white hair, but the main guy. Um, <clears throat> Secret Rivals has all those same people in it. Now, Secret Rivals was before the Invincible Armor, um, but I have a feeling it's going to be the same craziness, quality, amazingness. Uh, so this is a side note, but um, definitely can't recommend the Invincible Armor enough for sure. Yeah, classic. All right, on this episode's edition of Collecting Cool Stuff, I have a confession to make. Uh, I'm a sucker, a big-time sucker for these Super 7 figures. It's like all I get. It's all it's all I collect lately. Um, and I keep saying, like, you know, well, I'm only going to get stuff that really matters to me. And then the motherfuckers go and put out the Bruce Lee figures. Oh, so man, look how nice. What is poor man to do? Um, I tell you, you what, I, your I, ass gets all three. Up. Here you go. You got that style. When, you know, from Enter the Dragon, shirtless with the with the claw marks all oh, yeah. over. That's one of the most classic, right? You have the Game of Death version with the yellow jumpsuit. Even though that movie wasn't even completed, it's not even an official, official, official Bruce Lee movie. I mean, it wasn't. It was like test footage and stuff. Um, but that outfit is so iconic mm-hmm. uh you know it's been copied by quentin no, no. and other people no. too uh and then you have just the classic he's in this kind of outfit in almost every movie the black you know jumpsuit wow. so uh there was no way i was going to pass those up and guess what next time i do collecting cool stuff it'll probably be another super seven figure <laughs> I, I make alert. no guarantees or um uh, I just want to say, don't be disappointed in, in me if you think I'm in a rut because I keep choosing those. What am I supposed to do? Well, they make amazing figures. I was just they on do. their website about three days ago, and I almost bought five different things, but I had to I had to cool my jets. Yeah. Yeah, everything on there is awesome. You're still going to buy them. You're just going to buy them separately, so it won't seem like such a heavy right, purchase. Right. They'll, they'll be spread out a little bit. Hey, right. spread out. Right. <laughs> just, just, wait, just wait till I find them at Target. <laughs> right yeah he, he'll text us a picture of the one he's buying and then aaron will reply hey can you get those three other ones but greg will already be in the parking lot so he'll have to come back <laughs> into the store and go get them and check yes. out because that's, that's exactly that's the kind of friend that greg is kind of friendly <laughs> it's true man that's true. tight aaron good picks man dang Thank you. all right i have a uh a little segment that we do every once in a while um it's called friends doing cool stuff so I wanted to uh, give a shout out. Now, this is a guy that we've all known for a heck of a long time. You guys remember Rick Purenda, right? 
Uh, yeah. He used to be in Down Boys. Uh, then he was, I think he went by White Boy Rick for a while. Now he's going uh, with the moniker Dirty White and the High Life Social Club. And they have a brand new album out. And I, I, I was uh, hooked up with a CD copy of it. It's called The Rebuilding of a Broken Soul. And he recorded he recorded that at 54 Sound over in Ferndale. And uh, nice. it's uh, it's out now. And he did a show uh, last month, I believe. And uh, he had a great time at that show. I, I heard I didn't get to make it to that. But uh, another cool little collection or connection, I should say, is that I think it was probably back in like February, if I if, if I remember right. He had a track that came out before this record. It's, it's not even on this record. It's like a single before that. And I did a remix for him. It was kind of like a horror themed um, track that kind of dealt with like, you know, slasher film kind of topics uh, or whatever lyrics. And and he had a guest on there with him too. Um, Cancer of the God was the other rapper. And they kind of both did one verse each type of style. And uh, I, I did a remix for him and, and that's out there in the iTunes uh, world. But uh, yeah, so uh, if you like hip hop, Detroit hip hop, pick up that record for sure. Awesome. Yeah, we've known that guy a long time. And 54 Sound is like, didn't Eminem record there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for uh, those tons, that are keeping track at home. Yeah. Over the years, there's been tons of artists that have breezed through there and laid down cool stuff. I think uh, at some point, because Aaron, didn't a our buddy Anthony uh, tell us that like there was some white stripe stuff happening there back in like the late 90s or early 2000s? For some reason, I think I remember, or they were listening to mixes or something like that there, something. Uh, I think so. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. it's, it's a world class studio they have an ssl desk in there and all the gear that you'd imagine in, in, a, in a pro studio it's it's it, it's a great room for sure so that, that it's record literally slams it's literally walking distance from our favorite studio the temper mill that's right another killer studio um right down Michigan. the street that's right and they have a harrison console the same type of console that thriller was recorded on not the console but the same type of harrison 32 input console all right, our next segment in this episode of V3Cast has to do with film. We all love to watch some movies. Over the years, you get favorite actors, favorite films, favorite genres, all that kind of good stuff. So I thought it'd be a cool uh, exercise here to pick one actor and give me your top four films that they did. So it's a wide topic, man. And, and like our many topics we have, you ask me on a different day, I'll give you a different four, right? Or a different actor with different four <laughs> films too. <laughs> right. So this is just this stamp in time right now. Boom. Who is it? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to act like I'm rolling a 20 sided die here. Oh, 17. Aaron, you go first. <laughs> um, so I, I, I didn't want to choose like, I have like, you know, a top five actors and I didn't want to choose one of those people because I just wanted to, think outside my own box. <clears throat> so I was kicking around a lot of names and I somehow settled on Benicio del Toro. who's a great actor. Oh, wow. Um, I would not have seen that coming, man. Yeah. yeah that's a good one. And to hit you out of nowhere with that. Um, he's a great actor. He's, he's got such a, you know, such a distinct look, such a distinct style, but he also has a lot of range, but he's generally, generally a kind of a quiet actor he brings that kind of quiet um gravity to his performances but mm, there's all kinds of different um shades that he that he can do too so for the four movies um i went with uh, the first thing i ever noticed him in although he was in movies before this that i just he, he was just a dude in the movie that i didn't really know <clears throat> but Usual Suspects is what put him on the map. Yeah, I was going to say that. Probably everybody. Yeah. Uh, 1995, he played Fenster, one of the show stealers in, in that cast, and the whole cast is great. It's one of my favorite movies. I think all three of us, it's one of our favorite movies. Yeah, incredible. And um, right from the beginning, the first thing they show is him walking down the street, uh, and then the cops are coming to arrest him, and he starts walking the opposite way, and he has this just cartoony walk that he does there before he even says a word and then uh 
and then later when he when they're in the jail cell and he you know does the who stole the fucking truck <laughs> thing but he's so mumbly and he's just, he's got this accent that has never existed before or since because it, he just made up his own accent for that character um that's that's what you know made everybody notice him and, and so that's definitely the starter and then uh a few years later, 1998, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. That's uh, yeah. such a great, um, good one. It's the closest I ever need to get to doing drugs. <laughs> um, I read the book too, and it's pretty much exactly like the book. Uh, you know, Terry Gilliam there uh, directing that movie, and uh, he plays Doctor Gonzo in that movie. So he's like the supporting guy, um, the crazy lawyer of. Um, of uh hunter s thompson you know johnny depp's hunter s thompson and they're just so out of their minds in that movie um and you know of course maybe the best well there's the whole movie is great i can't choose a favorite scene but you know the part with the uh with the bathtub and he's like he wants him to he wants johnny depp to <laughs> drop the radio into the bathtub del toro's in the bathtub he wants him to drop the radio into the bathtub during White Rabbit, when uh, when Grace Slick hits the high note at the end, and he's, he's like, "You got to time it right. You got to drop <laughs> it in right there." And Johnny Depp, instead of like killing him, you know, uh, with the dropping the radio into the bathtub, he grabs this uh, he grabs a, a grapefruit, and hides it behind his back, and he's waiting for the song to peak, and then he just wails like the grapefruit at his head. And he just starts freaking out, and he chases him out. It's the best. Anyway, and doesn't the, the grapefruit like explode all over the wall too? I yeah. think I remember that. It explodes everywhere, and I don't know. I mean, you get the feeling that he didn't even, as an actor, he didn't even know he was going to do that. Of course, yeah, that might have been a surprise. You never know. So seriously, and then why are the grapefruits all over the floor and all over the like the 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 shelves and everything in that? I mean, the whole movie is just ridiculous and awesome yeah. uh, then a few years later in 2003 the hunted which was a not a really popular movie but it was kind of his his chance to do a rambo movie in a way because he plays a haunted well he's hunted but he's also a haunted veteran i think he was a special forces guy and um he just snaps this is like years after his service and he's out there going after anybody who challenges him and tries to bring him into justice and then uh tommy lee jones is his old commanding officer and they get him because he's the only guy who can go out there and and um you know either defeat him or or talk him down yeah. and they're like both knife experts so they have these great knife fights in the movie and he's just like uh you know he's a wrecking crew in that movie benicio del toro i don't um, know that one have to check it's that great out. it's a great one uh i don't remember who directed it but i remember loving it instantly and his name is aaron hallam in that movie and i like that name um <laughs> In 2005, you know, there's so many movies, so many great movies he did, but, but, uh, and this, he was definitely not the star of this movie, but, um, it's Sin City. Uh, he plays Jackie Boy. And once again, one of those show stealers in the movie, he's, he's a horrible dude. And then he dies in his scenes. And then he, his ghost starts talking to Clive Owen while he's driving the car. So he's got like a freaking, what does he have in his forehead? I think it's the, the clip of of the of the gun uh, i think it gets ejected into his head wow. I, I, anyway he's got something sticking out of his head so he's dead but he's he's his corpse animates in clive owen's imagination in his paranoia and he's talking to him while he's driving and uh and freaking him out so um that's a that's a great one too um so yeah, yeah benicio del toro those Solid. four great roles yeah, great man, and and that's uh, one I didn't know about, and and two, actually th all three after that I want to rewatch because I've seen the other three, just not in a long time. You know, right. I'm due to rewatch those. So man, the list is tall of stuff that that needs to be watched and revisited for sure. <laughs> it never ending list. <laughs> yeah, how about you, Greg? I picked somebody that I wish I didn't like so much because he's so damn handsome. <laughs> you know i i kind of like naturally want to dislike him because he's so damn handsome but uh i'm going with brad pitt right nice. and very handsome I'll, i'm i'm do i'm gonna start with i'm gonna do it in chronological order not necessarily order of my favorites but uh 
so the first the first and i also picked these movies based on his range because i think that was part of the question so he plays pretty significantly different people in all four of these um most people are probably already guessing where i'm going but i'm starting with fight club mm -hmm. um so you know he plays the super confident you know super handsome basically imaginary friend of <laughs> ed norton and that i don't i don't have to say anything else about fight club everybody knows it's great so fight club's the first one he's great in it uh but a year later he did a movie that that maybe isn't quite as big but uh he plays a character that where like aaron mentioned he sort of invented a an accent a little bit uh snatch yeah. mm. so remember in snatch he's he's got like a super thick accent that nobody can understand and uh so Even the that's people pretty... who are from his country like right yeah exactly um so so pretty significantly different than the, than the character you played in fight club and then uh the next one where he comes nine years later in glorious bastards um and he plays just yeah. total <laughs> love that role from, from yeah him. it's I, I i again with brad pitt in these movies i don't have to say much else i just need to tell you what they are bon um, you yeah you guys have seen him and uh and you you know that he's good in them and then i mean he's got so many movies that he's good in but then the then the most recent one that i really really loved um probably more so on the second time through watching it than the first time but uh once upon a time in hollywood i haven't seen that yet but it's, it's on my list man for sure so he plays um he plays like a stunt he's, he's like a stunt guy in hollywood and um, he's just really sort of casual in how confident he is. And there's a scene in particular that I like where he goes to the Spawn Ranch. And, uh, you know, like all of Charlie, uh, Charlie Manson's like hippie, you know, people are living there. And, and they've basically taken over the ranch of his friend. And I just really like that scene where he's like, he's like, yeah, you know, I want to talk to so-and-so. And they're like, oh, no, he's sleeping. And he's like all the same i came this all this way i'd really like to talk to him <laughs> and he keeps like forcing the issue not taking no know? for an answer right because he's convinced that you know these hippies have sort of taken over this guy's compound and uh it's just a really good movie and and again it it wasn't one that that i loved the first time i watched it but um after watching it the second time i, I i'm it's it's right up there with one of the best quarantine quentin tarantino movies nice. so brad pitt I wish Solid. he wasn't so damn handsome. I'd probably like him <laughs> even more. <laughs> it's a handsome dude. Handsome dude, right? You know, he Hard used to, to argue. he Hard just to argue. recently sold, but he owned, I'll, I'll put a link to a picture of it in the description, but he owned with another person this absolutely gorgeous recording studio where everything is like white on the inside. Everything is smooth mm. edges. It looks like, not like any recording studio you've ever seen. That tracks. Yeah. Um, okay, so for me, you know, we can go in any direction we want to. I dug deep and I chose one of my all-time favorites who one day I would love to meet and just fist bump and say thanks for doing all these great films, Bill Murray. The four that I would uh, highlight in, in this pick would be, uh, in no particular order because I love them all, but uh, Kingpin. Everybody loves uh, good old Ernie McCracken with the comb over and just he's such an asshole, especially to yep. Woody Harrelson's character. Yeah, so, that one's crazy. great. <laughs> um then uh groundhog day oh um, and by the way uh kingpin was 1996 uh, directed by the Farley brothers and uh groundhog's day uh 1993 directed by harold ramus uh phil connors you know um most people have seen all these films but phil i recommend every single one of them yeah bing <laughs> um what about bob is probably my favorite comedy of all time without hesitation i say that i know that about you, Steve. that's right uh directed by frank oz and then as i mentioned in the top of this list scrooged 1988 richard donner he plays frank cross the uh the overachieving tv exec who uh has to learn a lesson or two about life right <laughs> he bill murray did some he did some dramatic roles too what was that there was one that he did i can't remember the name of it well, they did ever, lost lost, in yeah lost in translation i think would be yeah, yeah that one. That. And there's not much comedy uh dark that's my four picks um i even have a a t-shirt 
that uh, the character Bob Wiley wore in What About Bob? The Don't Hassle Me, I'm Local on the on that bluish color shirt. I have one of those. My wife got it for me for my birthday a few years back with a matching can koozie. All right, so we have some Voyager 3 news to get through. And uh, got a few things to talk about. Um, some stuff we've mentioned before, but it's worth repeating. Um, we have a limited edition Doom Fortress album cover t-shirt on a nice yellow corn silk t-shirt. They call it, they, they call that color corn silk. And, it's not uh, made out of corn silk. No, not, no, no, no. But it is a comfortable shirt. It's ring spun cotton. So it's the soft stuff, the modern soft stuff. And we have that for sale in the Voyager store, V-O-Y-A-G-3R-Store.com. And uh, we have sizes small through 3X, and it's in stock, shipping worldwide. And along with the store, right now we're running a special for a few more weeks, a couple more weeks, all all the rest of June. If uh, your order is $35 or higher and you're in the contiguous United States, shipping is free. So this is a great time to pick up some Voyager 3 swag. And we just... Uh, added a, a handful of copies of New York Ninja on vinyl that we have and also the Blu-ray, which the last I checked is actually sold out or not available currently, even from Vinegar Syndrome. So we have a small stash of vinyl and Blu-rays of New York Ninja uh, on there as well. So grab something. And lastly, we're proud to remind you that on Saturday, July 29th, we will be playing live on stage at the after party for Motor City Nightmares. Um, so after the show uh, ends on Saturday, they have this other ballroom in the Sheraton Novi Detroit. And they open that up and they have like some costume contests and other announcements and fun stuff like that. And then we take the stage. Um, that is Motor City Nightmares, 15 year anniversary. So not bad, man, not bad. The whole show is July 28, 29, and 30th. And we play on that Saturday night. And we'll be there on the 29th and the 30th all day with our own table. We'll have all of our merch and we can sign some stuff for you. Fist bump, do photos, all that fun stuff. Talk about cool stuff like we're talking about right now. Uh, and really quickly. Yeah, it's going to be a fun weekend, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It always is. That's one of my absolute favorite conventions. Um, of any ones that I've been to, and I've been to some in other states. Um, Motor City Nightmares has it together for sure. All right, and this final topic of V3 Cast number 26, we're going to talk about the brand new Godflesh album entitled Purge. Uh, all of us have loved Godflesh since we were in high school, and man, we, we've all seen them live once or twice, I think. Um, yeah, an incredible band, incredible trend-setting band. Uh, they helped invent a whole uh, branch of metal. Um, absolutely incredible band, for sure. And I'm, I'm glad they're back. This is their third record since they kind of came back from their um, breakup that happened uh, maybe in the early 2000s. Yeah, this is called Purge, and it's out now on all the streaming platforms and vinyl and all that good stuff. I totally love the record. Um, yeah. I've been I've been spinning it all week, and uh, it's, it hits all the things that I like about Godflesh, the sample kind of intros, and the just wonderful distorted bass rhythm that just kind of keeps looping and repeating, and then Justin kind of goes nuts over on top of it. Wonderful and drum machine, ah, love it. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I I loved, loved it from the beginning, and then listening to it kind of critically for the. the for this episode um i was noticing the overall structure of the album you have like basically you have four or five in a row that are kind of traditional god flesh although that doesn't mean like that doesn't mean typical in any way it just means like sort of more what you'd expect and um a little more straightforward maybe you know you have like nero the first song you have that that cool little inverted beat that it does for the bridge where it's it's playing the beat and then the the snare switches and uh um i love that second song landlord with um those dissonant high notes the guitar so you got a cool little guitar riff going 
um yeah and and they're more upbeat for the first first half of the album and then you kind of sink into this weird like dreamlike state for the second half of the album a lot of the second half is more either more sludgy more bogged down but then then other parts are more spare like the third song army of non kind of actually sounded to me like something that could be right off pure um and then by the time you get to track four lazarus leper i'm thinking like okay these first three songs are really cool and 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 uh but i would love to hear a tone change here and then boom song four is very different from from kind of anything i've heard from god flesh really or at least different from the beginning of the album and it's yeah. got this um really cool beat a really cool more abstract beat that doesn't just it does it never really kicks into like a more typical beat it's like very restrained you know and um really cool air and space in the guitars you know um it's not super heavy that that fourth song and then that kind of just kind of keeps cascading through the rest of the album where it gets kind of weirder and weirder in yeah. in the coolest you know way and very dreamlike and then i remember uh track seven mythology of self towards the end it does this crazy weird I don't, it's just a sound effect i mean it does i don't i don't think any guitar could make this but it sounds like a freaking time portal or something it's like it's like um towards the end of the song and then actually once the music stops that thing keeps going it's some weird kind of pulsing ringing yeah. thing listen for it next time yeah for and sure it's it's super cool so the album just kind of descends into you know total weirdness which is so so great so what i was going to say about godflesh first of all start at the beginning if it wasn't for godflesh the, the three of us might not even know each other that's a very good because point. because if you remember I was playing it. I was playing in a local, you know, metal progressive metal band and you guys were doing your thing in forge, which at the time was just the two of you and a drum machine. Right. And, and, and a lot of that sound was probably based on the fact that you love God flesh so much. Yeah. <laughs> but sure. I was equally obsessed with God flesh. And when I met you guys in that record store, when you guys were flyering and we got to talking about music, you know, I was sort of intrigued by the idea of mixing or incorporating live drums with the electronic drums that you guys were already doing. So like, that's, that's sort of what got me interested in, in forge, you know, and, and, and especially after talking to you guys about the direction you were headed and things like that. So any, anyways, long story short, you know, had it not been for God flesh and how much they inspired, like both me separately from you guys. And then the two of you collectively, you know, maybe, maybe we'd never known each other, you know, we probably, oh, that's certainly probably, certainly probably wouldn't have played in the band together um right. you know it probably would have just been a, a random meeting in a store and we would have moved on with our lives so you know i sort of attribute like that whole this whole path a little bit to god you know it was, yeah, no it, you're 100 percent right dude 100 percent. Right. i mean i mean it was our collective interest in that band that sort of brought us together so anyhow that's where i wanted to start with this and then i agree with what aaron said and what you said i i feel like you know, the first half of this record is definitely Godflesh. It's exactly what you think it will sound like. And then I agree with Aaron, but, and, and I'm going to go one step further. I think the stuff that's on the tail end of the record is the stuff I'm more interested in because I was talking about Tangerine Dream earlier. I um, am definitely into some of the more minimal, you know, ambient sort of stuff like, you know, Eno and, and, you know, throughout the years, I've been into a lot of electronic music. And in fact, like Godflesh inspired like one of my favorite bands of all time, Scorn, which was, yeah. well, I don't know if, I don't know if Godflesh inspired them or if they just sort of, you know, so that, that whole thing sort of happened at the same time. But Scorn is, uh, you know, Mick Harris from Napalm Death started Scorn in like 1991. And uh, it was very similar, you know, so like, the first couple of scorn records sound very much like Godflesh, but then, then Mick Harris sort of, you know, what I liked about Mick Harris was he was a drummer, I think, and uh, pretty sure about that. And I always felt like the scorn stuff was more based around the drums. You know, the drum patterns and the rhythms were more, were, were really interesting to me, but like Godflesh inspired a bunch of other bands that I liked too, like pitch shifter and fudge tunnel and nail bomb. And, and then, you know, the one thing that I always said about Godflesh when I heard him the first time was, uh, I feel like 
I feel like this is the end of music. <laughs> you know, yeah. like this is as dark and dank and, you know, just sludgy. Apocalyptic. As, as, yeah. As, as music can get. Right. But, but then, you know, like anything, there are bands that took what Godflesh did and took it even one step further. So I think of like, you know, Sun, you know, the band Sun, it's like, a little Sun, bit. it's like Sun, but then it's got the, Oh, I think it's like based on an amplifier logo. But anyways, like they're sort of like what I, I think of the end of music now, but certainly Godflesh, when we heard it for the first time, it was unlike anything we had heard. And it was yeah. just so, so different and, and really dark and really, you know, like, Oh, you can make music that sounds like this, you right. know, and like yeah, it was it was refreshing, um, like to be it like, was like oh, a new, wow. and and like I said, it inspired so many so many bands to to try using drum machines and incorporating that into the sound, and then I mean, obviously, industrial got huge after that, you know, like yeah. Ministry and all those bands had a ton of success playing, you know, music with with uh electronic drums incorporated so you know another band that really um uh got inspired from godflesh would definitely be fear factory for sure oh yeah absolutely like he even sings like justin right you know, like right oh when 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 justin came out with that that when he hits those long notes now that that ethereal kind of floaty oh no one was doing anything like that no. i mean i'd never heard anybody sing like that and uh and so it was just a, a guarantee that anybody who did it afterwards was getting it from him like you know which i'm sure that uh what's the guy's name from fear factory burton seabell i'm sure he would be the first to admit that he was heavily influenced by by godflesh right yeah no one sure. could come up with that that sort of style uh on their own without hearing it you know first with godflesh but yeah uh, for those of you who are fans of Godflesh, what albums do you love the most from Godflesh and where do you rank this brand new one, Purge? And if you don't know who Godflesh is, check it out. The other whole catalog is on all the streaming platforms. This may be an introduction to something that you end up loving if you've never heard of them before. Um, but let us know in the comments for sure. And uh, we'll see people at the show here in Detroit. We're going to definitely be at that show hanging out. As I haven't seen Godflesh in a long, I think the Pure Tour was the last time I saw them. I never made it to any of the other shows somehow, or they didn't come to Detroit or whatever. We were touring in Forge back in the day. We weren't around a lot. Um, so I haven't seen them since 1992. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe our buddy uh, from Canada will be there who, who's yelling at them to hurry up because my man's got to catch the tunnel bus. You never know. He might be. <laughs> if he is. I'm going to walk up to him and hug him. He won't have any idea why, but he's, he's been living rent free in our minds for the past 30 years. Right. <laughs> you guys All better right. bring your wallets to that God bless show, man. Oh, I'm going to be picking like up at, some stuff. Me, just like me at Tangerine dream. You guys are going to be in trouble. Yep. Yeah. Big time well, trouble. you might have to text me a quick picture of the merch booth at Tangerine dream. And then, and then if I see something awesome, I, I'll PayPal you immediately the 40 bucks it costs or whatever it is. And you can grab me one thing if you don't mind. <laughs> like maybe Definitely. if they have a Blu-ray of, you know, some old show or something like that. I, I don't know what they'd have, but I'm just, I'm just riffing. But uh, man, you're going to enjoy the hell out of that for sure. Oh yeah. Plus it's always fun to go to Chicago for a weekend or a day or whatever. Man, Chicago is exactly great. right. Chicago is great. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we, uh, we're going to call it a day for this episode of V3 cast. We want to thank everybody for hanging out with us. If you have any thoughts on the topics that we've had, any stories, anecdotes, or suggestions, drop them in the comments. If you like a sci-fi progressive rock band that scores films to, uh, doing a podcast, like, and subscribe, it helps us out. And also let us know your top actor or actress and their four favorite films of yours. So until next time, this has been V3Cast.